Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Bricks King Podcast, where I'm going to bend your ear about Lego, review those amazing bricks of plastic, and discuss what is new and up and coming around the Lego world. I'm your minifig host, Matt. Let's build on it. Welcome in, everybody. How are you doing today? We have some more Lego Master stuff from episode number nine. We have one episode after this, the finale. Three teams, one winner. Who will it be? We'll have to find out this sometime in the next week. So this week, they had to build roller coasters. They were looking for a loop or something more intricate than just kind of um, a standard, like a like a crazy mouse type idea. If you've ever, if you if you have any idea what I'm talking about, like a crazy mouse, there's no loops or anything like that. It, it's it's I think of it, I guess, as like a wooden roller coaster because there's no loops in in those either. There is something else I did like. As they were kind of being semi-touristy, the judges will, whatever. The new ideas camera that is coming, I think it's a new ideas camera. They um they, there was a nice promo for that. I thought that was neat. So the judges had mentioned it needs a mechanical lift, so motors, and it needs a crazy drop. So first up, we're gonna talk about Sam and Nina. They named theirs the Kraken. You know, if you know anything about the Kraken, it's a Seattle-based hockey team. Maybe that was the uh, the idea there. Maybe they were going after that. I think I think Sam's Canadian though. I think anyway, they had a long lift that is inclined. Obviously, you reach the top of this thing and it dropped into a loop, into a few spots where there are tentacles hanging out because you know Kraken that are essentially attacking the passengers as they go through this thing. Finally, finally, it leads into a 180 degree turn. I thought that was really, really, really kind of cool. And that is essentially turning away from what is supposed to be this, you know, it looks like the Sarlacc pit mouth, whatever you want to call it from Star Wars. And that was really cool. You know, they're, they're basically saved and they're not going into the mouth of this thing. So that was kind of neat. And then obviously it starts all over again. So Jamie said it was uh, really impressive with the water movement that was up and down. I thought, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Um, that was really, really kind of a cool idea that they had going on down, I guess, down below. Yeah, obviously not on the roller coaster itself. The problem is you couldn't see it initially. And the thing that I hated about this, you know, when they were showing things and, and it goes, you know, it's a, a common theme. You cannot see Every single thing that is going on, you can't see all these intricate things on the builds because it's just a, a quick pan through and it sucks. They, you know, they're more worried on the story and stuff like that. And I get it. It just, um, you know, it, it, it's like the uh, production. It just kind of failed for me. You just you just have to do better on that kind of stuff. Do better. So up next, we had Christopher and Robert. They named theirs the Dragon Dance. They used nine motors, nine. It was absolutely insane. I was like, wait a minute. What do you mean you're using nine motors? So obviously this is an Asian inspired theme, but it had a baby dragon meeting its mother. So cool. There were a massive amount of spirals leading to this mega drop, which was wicked. And it literally... It was, it was literally a 90 degree drop straight down. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, over exaggerating here. I, I mean, it was literally a 90 degree drop straight down the, uh, the mechanism that was used to lift the, uh, the train up all the curves looks like, um, like a giant sweeping bar, like the vertical length of the stack. So you're going up, you're going straight up on this idea here. You know, you don't have this incline and the way this sweeping arm rotated around, it would pick the car up at the bottom, lift it to the top as the arm is rotating up and it just worked. It worked ingeniously. It was so well done. So something that I noticed, well, this is how it worked. There was a small little two by two tile 
that was affixed to part of the roller coaster car to help it move up that arm. So that is that was your catch on it. Not like, hey, there's the catch. That was what they were using to be able to catch the car to be able to lift it. Honestly, this thing was literally 100% perfect. There was no flaw in this whatsoever. Incredible mechanical engineering going on with this thing. I mean, the the funny thing is the judges initially were kind of like, I don't know if this is going to work. You know, this is really bold, you know, or, you know, it could be a massive failure. Yeah, they totally ate crow. They totally retract their opinions at the end as well, which was great. You know, Christopher and Robert, you know, they're reserved dudes, but it was kind of like, na 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 boo boo, stick your head in doo doo. Anyway, Paul and Nalita were up next. They did, theirs was called Game Time. It was a sports themed roller coaster. It had a, this is a double drop, by the way, coaster, or if you want to call it like a dueling coaster, if you've ever ridden one of those. I'm a giant coaster fanatic, so anywhere I can go to get on a coaster is fantastic for me. So each of these coasters had a small loop that they went through, obviously, and then they obviously come down and split off their own ways and go back up. So the entire thing was inspired by their family during... Um, the holiday or during the holidays or, you know, that kind of thing by all the games that they play, if, you know, the family games, holiday games, whatever, you know what I mean? Families get together and they play all these kind of games and stuff like that is, you know, it's, it's just a lot of fun. So after the drop for each of these, the trains are pushed to the opposite line. So they didn't go the way it, the way it ended, you would come down and it would and it would essentially switch over. This is basically one entirely long connected track, even though it was two tracks or two coasters. So after the after the first dropped, they're paired evenly, right? So there's really no like true winner, but you know, the idea that they are essentially timing these things, that is incredibly difficult to make sure it's done that way. So kudos to them. I thought that was really cool. Amy was not a fan though, because it felt like she felt that it was um, like it lacked a theme. Like they had given this idea of, Hey, this is what our theme kind of is, but it definitely kind of lacked overall. And I, I could see that. I, you know, I agree 100%. It kind of almost looked like a, like another build in a box idea, right? You know, not really going outside of, you know, the safety, the comfort zone, just kind of sticking to that easy peasy kind of thing. So Emily and Kelly are up next here. They did the ladybug flight. The idea was to shrink down to a ladybug and fly through this garden of chrysanthemums, which were spinning. That was a really cool touch to it. I thought that was kind of neat. They had brick belt spiders and butterflies that were throughout and everything. Their coaster was not near as tall as the rest, but it did work. There were no hangups. Nobody had any hangups, so that was a that was a, a good thing as well. Emily, I think Emily was the one that basically was the one that was doing the operation part of this, and um, you know the mechanics behind it, and she nailed it. She did a really good job. The one thing I saw here, though is that it feels like a mashup of a few Lego roller coasters without a loop. There's no loop, right? We've had a few coasters already. And I, and I mentioned this before, it's almost kind of like a, the crazy mouse idea that, that some theme parks have. It's uh, like here, we have a six flags. If you theme park, if you don't know what six flags means just by that, it's essentially a version of a roller coaster that doesn't go high there are no loops and it just rotates on a pivot point with a spinning wheel in the passenger area, right? People can make it go slower or faster or not at all. So when you go kind of up and down these hills, you know, the, the, the actual car is rotating on the, what do you want to call it? The, the train piece underneath the wheels and stuff like that. So Amy liked the theme. Jamie smashed the lack of loops and major curves. And I agree it did, it was totally lacking. It was a big, 
it was a big focal point that they wanted to see. They wanted to see this big drop. They wanted to see some loops. They wanted to see some crazy and there was no crazy. So we had a winner and our winner was Christopher and Robert, obviously, without a doubt. You know, there, there's no doubt in my mind that they were not the winner. No doubt in my mind. It was, it was an easy call. So then they called up the other teams and stuff like that. So because you have three that are making it to the finale. Unfortunately, Emily and Kelly were going home. I, I you know, they, they, they tried their best throughout this competition. And there were many times where I was like, oh, they, they may be going home today. And then they, you know, they made it out. And, you know, it's, it's important <laughs> to be able to make it out, you know, and, and, you know, move on just a little bit more. So let's talk about the basement dwellers here. And this is important for a number of reasons. Like I have said in the past, usually if you are in the basement, usually that second time you're going home, this was their third time. Last week was their second time. That should have been, you know, a, Hey, like, here we go. You, you better be ready to go. This is, this is where the big leagues were playing in. And unfortunately, it didn't work for them. So they had the most being in the bottom two, which was crazy three times. So the power rankings real quick. Christopher and Robert, without a doubt, were number one. Sam and Nina, Paul and Nalita, you know, were there. I mean, we're essentially just, <laughs> you know, rehashing the same thing. The only thing is that Sam and Nina did move up to second. They just swapped with Paul and Nalita just due to the fact that their build was a little bit better. Overall, the, the storyline behind it was much better. So that's why they're at two. Paul and Nalita, you know, at three. And obviously Emily and Kelly were in fourth place because they're going home. So early on, I, I think maybe I said in episode two, I thought Christopher and Robert were absolutely going to smash this competition. There were some times where they didn't have the best build, but right now they are just hitting full stride, you know, coming into the finale. I, I hope there's no funny business like there was last year where the entire community, you know, were like, I'm sorry, what? Let's hope that's not the case. Um, and, you know, we, we see some quality builds, you know, you've got some really good Builders that are left, I'm going to call my shot and say Christopher and Robert win it. You know, Sam and Nina, depending on what the challenge is, Sam and Nina could absolutely come about and, and you know, smash the competition. But I don't know. Christopher and Robert are going to be really difficult to beat. They have showed that they can, you know, mechanically engineer the crap out of some builds. And, you know, nine motors on this build... There, there's nothing they're they're afraid of. You know, technic skills are impeccable. You know, telling a story, designing, and actually following through to show the story with the build. You know, Sam, Sam is definitely the driving force on his team. And I think that's going to be a downfall for him and Nina just due to the fact that, like I said, he is the driving force. He is, she is essentially like an assistant. Christopher and Robert have done a really good job. They both kind of jump in and you know, like I said, engineer the crap out of everything that they do. Paul and Nalita, I don't know. Um, they've really come a long way. I I could see them winning it based on whatever challenge it could be. There's potential for them to win it. I just don't know. I don't know if they have enough to be able to take it to Christopher and Robert. I could see them finishing in second to Sam and Nina. Ahead of Sam and Nina, I guess I should say. But, you know, honestly, I don't know how those two are going to fall. And I, I don't know if they're going to be like, well, you're first, second and third. I, I doubt that is probably the way it's going to go. And I cannot remember back to last season, but I'm pretty sure that's not the way it went. So the next episode, obviously the finale, it's it's going to be wild. I'm really curious to see how it comes about and, you know, how how what the challenge really is going to be. Obviously, it's going to be something incredibly spectacular and you're going to have to hit every element. You're going to have to hit, you know, a story or something like that. I'm, I'm just really curious to see what it's going to end up as. So that is going to wrap up this episode of Lego Masters. And I've got something coming up that I want to talk about of a game that is releasing. And it's super, well, it's not releasing as far as a game. It's a side mode. But we're going to talk about coming up. We're going to be talking about Lego Fortnite. I think there's mega potential there 
to just continue on and who knows how long it'll last, but um, that'll be coming up. So until we meet again, I'm your Minifig Ghost Matt. Let's build on it.